Hey everyone, welcome back. Kyle with Andrew Hilton here, and welcome to our Big Misses episode. Um, fun part of running a wine store is you can't just buy what's currently hot, what's currently exciting and popular, because if you do, the people who are already out ahead of the curve, they've already beat you to the real cool stuff. Now, because of the fact that you always have to be jumping out ahead, it does mean that sometimes you, um, you leap before you look and you do end up buying really heavy on some wines or some regions or some ideas that you just slightly missed. And this is kind of our tribute to things that we really expected to be big in 2020 and in one case really 2019. Um, and things that maybe they were big internationally, maybe we were scrambling, maybe it was something where we were just flatly wrong. Sometimes me and Devin just stand around after work and we share a couple or three glasses of wine and we get really excited about something. And then we really talk ourselves into it. Um, that certainly can happen. And these are four examples of exactly that happening. So our first wine tonight is going to be the Seven Year by Berthe Bonde. Now, the Savignier is based in the grape Savignon. Uh, Aaron, I think it might be map cams o'clock if you've got a second for me. Shall we jump into the maps? <laughs> Aaron was not expecting the map this early. Right here? All right. Let's me run over. So I'm going to step around here just for a second and completely ruin the light. Thank you, sir. <laughs> You can tell we are really prepared. This is our first big miss of 2021. Um, so the Jura is way over here in eastern France. It's not the most far, far east region. That's Alsace way up here on the Franco-German border. We're further south here down by Switzerland. Now the neat thing about Jura is how close it is to Burgundy and to a lesser extent to Savoie. Uh, why it's important to being close to Burgundy is there's a lot of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in the Jura and it's very heavily influenced by that. Uh, why it's interesting it's close to Savoie is just like Savoie it has been absolutely ignored less so in France but certainly internationally until the last five years. So let's jump away from the map here and let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Savignon as a grape variety the Jura region a little bit and why I was so fired up about this and how I got it so entirely wrong. So the Jura being a wine region out in the east of France, it was not historically one that was really heavily popular in terms of exports. So if we want to look at France in kind of a tale of three stages, the first stage of French exports, it was all about regions that had a port, the Rhone Valley, the southern Rhone's right on the Mediterranean. You've got Bordeaux, which uh, has a port right on um, the Atlantic Ocean. Burgundy, if you follow the, valley, uh, the Loire River down, uh, it does end up on the ocean, as does the Loire. So really, that was where our real understanding of these major regions in France of Bordeaux, Burgundy, the Rhone, and the Loire comes from is f in terms of exports, they had rivers. They had easy ways to get the wine to a port and out of France. Now, of course, railroads and highways were a thing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, but in terms of global wine drinking, we were in really early days. I mean, the idea of like Chardonnay and Merlot and Cabernet being like brand names in terms of wine didn't come around until about 1983 and 1984 in the US, and a couple of three years later than that in Canada. Um, really and truly, unless you knew what you were putting in your mouth, like you wouldn't know what a Jura Savignon was, and in those early, early days of the wine industry, unless you were actually at like a specialist wine bar, and there really weren't very many of those in the 1970s, these wines were really not sold outside of France. And more than that, they weren't sold outside the specific region where they were grown. Now, the second phase of that would be the the Southern France explosion, the big wine boom that really started in the early 1990s, was certainly red hot by the mid 90s, and to a certain point is going on today. 
wine sales were flat. After, you know, beer and spirits, wine was still thought of as something, you know, you had at church with communion, that you had with your grandparents. You maybe just had it Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. It was a special occasion thing. The idea of wine taking the place of spirits or beer as like an everyday drink is relatively new. That's kind of 1990, 1992, and forward. Uh, especially in Alberta, which is when we got privatization. Um, that led to a huge explosion of bulk wine production, mostly in the south of France in what we now call Languedoc-Roussillon. And that was where we saw the explosion of things like Fat Bastard and the 150 imitators that came out of Fat Bastard. And they were growing wines that were familiar to the North American palate, and they weren't labeled as Bordeaux or Burgundy or the Rhone or the Jura or anything else. They were labeled as Merlots and Chardonnays and Sauvignon Blancs and Shirazes. These were labeled as wines that would be very easy to understand for people in the North American market who'd started drinking wine not by the region. They'd, you know, first tasted wine in a California Merlot or California Cabernet or Chardonnay. They weren't familiar with these old world wine regions. So the second big French wine explosion or the second stage of it really was these South French wines. We're now in kind of the third wave where, okay, nobody can really afford to drink Bordeaux or Burgundy on the regular anymore. I own a wine store and I can't afford to drink Bordeaux or Burgundy. Um, the Loire Valley, the really famous stuff is now starting to take off. You know, Vouvray at $25 doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, most of the, the big, big regions are basically priced out of everyday drinking. So we're now coming to the slightly less famous regions. We're starting to dig into Savoie, into Jura, uh, into Gaillac, into Alsace a little bit. Um, we're starting to, and, and then the other thing is some of those southern regions that you know made their initial bread and butter selling kind of $12 Merlot. Um, actually, legally it had to be 100% Merlot, but I'm just putting it in the air quotes because they weren't very good wines. Um, they're now starting to get a little more serious. Some of those big chunky vineyards where, you know, 100 hectares are now being broken up into small parcels and turned into premium estates. We're now into a point where if you want Bordeaux or Burgundy, you can still buy them. They're still $30, but you can get into them. And they're okay at that price point. But if you want like Chambon Moussigny or you want like Chablis Premier Cru or any of that, you're really getting into like the super, super high end range. Um, I'll jump ahead a little bit here and kind of explain that with um, the Caneto Rossi di Montepulciano just as an example. So I was talking about uh, Rossi di Montepulciano and its big brother Vino Nobile di Montepulciano with my dad. When he opened in 1985, a bottle of Wolf Blast Yellow Label was $11. Great. That's perfectly reasonable. That broadly tracks with inflation. Wolf Blast Yellow Label on our shelves I think is like $18.95 or $19.95. That's about what it should cost. Um, the thing is, is a bottle of Vino Nobile, the big brother of this, was like 13 or $14 on the shelf at the time. It's now 35 The famous regions have gotten big enough and so respected, and the price dollar, the, the dollar value has gotten a little bit less generous to the consumer, shall we say, uh, such that some of these famous regions, they've, just, they've gotten so much more expensive even compared to other ones that were about the same dollar value even back then. So let's jump into this. So this is from the Jura, and this is the native Jura white grape variety. Now, there's five grapes that are grown in Jura, three red, two white. Now, is that a gross oversimplification? Are there lots more other things that are grown here? Yes, but let's just keep it fairly simple. On the white side, we have Chardonnay because of the Burgundian influence, and we have Sauvignon, their local specialty. We'll circle back to that in one sec. Red grapes, we have Pinot Noir, again from Burgundy, and then we have Poulsard and Trousseau, which are the native grapes. Uh, Poulsard, generally speaking, done more often as a rosé. Um, Trousseau, more often done as a red, although there are certainly red examples of Poulsard and rosé examples of Trousseaus, as well as blends of the two. Um, Sauvignon is the native grape, and Sauvignon's really, really old. Let's get this in my mouth here just briefly. Just as Aaron got his zoom correct on the glass, I decided to take Put a drink. down in the same place. Don't waste my time. <laughs> Uh, Craig asks, who, drinks, uh, who drank most of this stuff before? This would have been local consumption and a little tiny bit in the UK, uh, as well as um, like Paris, you would be able to find Jura wines. But really and truly, Jura was drank kind of in Jura. Um, I'll also just uh, jump ahead a little bit. I'm going to have nothing to talk about with the last wine here. 
Um, but let's jump onto the Canetto Montepulciano here. Um, so when this got DOC status in 1966, there were eight wineries making this. There were 150 hectares on earth that were devoted to Montepulciano. Uh, these days there's about 230 to 250 wineries and about 1,300 hectares. So there is also more wine. So the same amount of Jura um, wasn't being produced, say, in the 1950s. Are you zooming in on my notes? It no. un seems unfair. <laughs> writing. I do have very nice writing. I keep being told that. Except by my wife, whose ri who's writing is nicer than mine, so she always makes fun of mine. Uh, uh, we'll show everybody. And yes, Kevin, we, we did barely have enough. The irony of the fact that our tasting of wines we couldn't sell uh, ended up being completely sold out to the point where we were actually sold out of three out of the four wines. Um, because these weren't things I really wanted to reorder because they were massive sales failures. Um, three out of the four wines before tonight's tasting. So thank you, everyone. That was very unexpected and very exciting. So um, let's jump into this Savignon a little bit here. And let's talk about this. Um, what Savignon is, is just like Pinot Noir, it's one of the oldest grape varieties that we still make wine out of. Uh, the oldest grape variety is Muscat. We actually uh, can actually take uh, scrapings from the inside of amphora uh, from like biblical times, like the year zero. We can actually have, the people have taken scrapings of the insides of wine amphora from that period and genetically tested them and they are Muscat. We've been making Muscat for like 2,000 years, which is insanity. Um, in terms of this, we're talking about late 15th century is about as far back as we track most of the classical grape varieties. Uh, Pinot Noir and Savignon are two of the oldest. Uh, Savignon, most people are not familiar with now. Uh, you are probably familiar with a mutation of Savignon that tastes absolutely nothing like it. Now, Savignon, when I get it in the nose, it's got some aromatics, like it's got some really pretty honey, and it's got some beeswax, it's got some oil, it's got some apple and pear. It's got some really, really neat yeast notes, which we'll get to in a second. But I wouldn't say this is a desperately aromatic wine. What this mutated into is Gewurztraminer, perhaps the most, if not the absolute most, aromatic white grape variety. In fact, no, screw white grape variety, grape variety on planet Earth. If you haven't had it, Gewurztraminer smells like everything. It smells like every flower. It smells like every candy. It smells like every fruit. It's lychee and perfume and roses and just tropical fruit. It's completely over the top. I would really struggle to sit down and drink an entire bottle of like really good Alsatian gewurz to myself. I can thoroughly enjoy a half bottle with dinner, especially if we're like doing something really nice like going to Vija's place in Vancouver and doing it there because I think uh, Indian food or Indian fusion and uh, and gewurz are an absolutely perfect pairing. But like a whole bottle of Alsatian Grand Cru gewurz to myself would be almost too much. You'd get so much flavor fatigue. But like sitting around drinking like 750 mils of like fireworks, it's it's kind of insane. So how did this ancient variety kind of mutate into gewurz? Well, that's kind of the magic of wine. But more than that, it also is a parent grape of a lot of different things that we still drink today. It's a parent of Chenin Blanc. It's a parent of Sauvignon Blanc. And of course, Sauvignon Blanc is one of the two parent grapes of Cabernet Sauvignon. So where did Cabernet Sauvignon came from? It came from Sauvignon. Um, Silvaner, which is a grape variety we will probably never taste on the channel because it's boring. And if you age it to make it more interesting, it just tastes like ketchup. Um, uh, Sylvaner, yes. Uh, Trousseau is a, uh, another one, as well as a uh, Grüner Veltliner. Um, so yeah, this is a great variety that's got a really long history. So why did we bring this in? What, what brought us to um, Jura Savignon? Uh, this comes back to, I want to say 2018, uh, when Devin and I were doing our WSET courses in Calgary. At that exact moment, um, Bar van der Fel had really just opened and all of Calgary was having this like moment in terms of wine drinking. It was like, drink Savignon, eat Comte. They're this amazing pairing. Uh, and if you went to Bar van der Fel, like they, they would shave you Comte like right off the wheel. Uh, and then you would just have it with Savignon. That was a huge thing that was going on. So when Dev and I were hanging out in Calgary and being very impressionable, um, all anybody wanted to talk about was Jura wines. So we got really excited about Jura wines and we ordered a bunch of them. 
Now, have some of our Jura wines been a huge success? Yes, they have. Um, actually, this the this last batch of Jura wines that we brought in has done really well. Uh, I don't have any Tissot wines left because Tissot sold really well. Uh, but these Berthe Bondé, we bought a lot. And I mean like five, six cases of each in some of these cases. Um, and they didn't work. Um, there's two ways of making Jura Sauvignon. Uh, this style is called Rie, uh, which basically means clean or topped up, where when it's being aged in the barrel, they keep topping it up with new wine so the wine doesn't oxidize. The other style, which is, um, which is perhaps more traditional, uh, is called souvoir or under floor. Uh, this is aged like a fino sherry, where they actually let that crust of yeast and bacteria form on the top, and the wine ages under that. Um, really, really good high-end Sauvignon from Jura. Um, it tends to taste much more like a fino sherry. Uh, the most e extreme examples of that, the most that get the most oxidation, the most barrel aging like that, uh, are actually called vin jaune. So they tend to be very, very different. Anyone want to split on a case of this? Um, I probably can get another case of this, but I need to look into this. Um, the, the irony of our wines that didn't sell tasting, I still have a couple, three cases of the Rossi Multiple Channel left. Um, I can order more of the Badenhorst. Uh, but the Rottensteiner and the Savonier, which we have had since 2018, this has been on the shelf with literally no one buying it for two and change years. Um, I, I don't have any on order because I was selling about a bottle every other month it, at best. So I don't have any more because the tasting was a huge hit. Uh, and more than that, I just, why would I order something that I was desperately trying to get out of to a certain point? Um, need to talk more about the soils. Um, I will be honest, I dug into this quite a bit with this. I don't know exactly what here is grown on decomposed granite, what's grown on marl. I don't know the exact soil structures on these. Um, I'm not Eric Mercier from Juice Imports because Eric's, um, Eric's kind of the best. He really does have this incredible knowledge of what the soil structures are under everything that he represents. Also because he's been to all these vineyards, it's probably more, it's easier to keep in your head if you've actually seen the soils and seen the vineyards. I haven't been to any of these, unfortunately. So I think, uh, I think all of our agronomists are going to be disappointed. And yeah, uh, I think Grant, Grant nails this, actually. Um, it's gentle and it's soft with lemons. Um, I know how much hashtag mouthfeel is becoming a bit of a meme here, but like, this is just so weighty and rich and round, and it's just so generous. This one actually has an absolute ton of acid to it, but it's not coming off like a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc or even like a dry Riesling where the acid is just like bang right there. This is a wine that's coming off very soft and round and gentle and just, can you imagine this with, um, Comte is a fairly hard cheese. You want to think of it as maybe just one step less hard than say a Parmesan. Um, you're pretty much right there. Can you imagine that with like a ripened aged cheese like that? It's just going to be a massive burst of flavor in your mouth of concentrated fatty flavor. And then you bring this in to kind of wash that away and introduce like all this acidity and these ripe fruit flavors. I absolutely love this. John asks, could I share the map one more time? Aaron, are you ready for map cam? Yeah, I can get on the map cam. Are we going to do the map cam? All right. Yes, we can do the map cam one more time. Uh, we want to see the Jura region, which is over here. Map cam. Map cam go. Map cam go. All right. So here we are in France. We are in eastern France. Uh, I don't know exactly how zoomed in Aaron is, but um, Bordeaux's over here. Here's Burgundy. Uh, your Loire region or your classical Loire region kind of starts at Nevers and works its way down uh, to Nantes. Uh, so here's Burgundy. Here's Savoie, Champagne's way the hell up in the north up here. But Jura's right here, really close to Switzerland. Now, we are getting close to the Swiss Alps here, or Franco-Swiss Alps. Um, this is definitely a high altitude region, which is why we have so much acidity in this white wine. But yeah, the Jura is not really that close to anywhere else. It's, it's definitely a, a road to get to Beaujolais. There might be a railway, but there's, there's really no river links. So historically, it was very isolated in terms of how they could actually get the wine to market. Um, 
And again, when we talk about, you know, your major population centers being, you know, Paris, Orléans, Marseille, it's not really close to any of them. It tends to be very isolated geographically. Uh, really, the only thing it's really close to in terms of wine is Dijon, uh, which is up here at the kind of the northern tip of Burgundy. Um, but even Dijon is not a really big place. It's a really important place wine-wise, but it's not a very big actual urban center. So yes, what was our big mistake with this one? Our big mistake was falling in love with the Jura and not coming back with the, with, you know, we did sell a lot of Jura wines and we continue to sell a lot of Jura wines. We just bought way too heavy, way too early based on a wine movement that was happening in Calgary and thinking somewhat arrogantly that we'd just be able to automatically make that transfer down here, you know? Long story short, this is on the table because we couldn't. Um, that said, uh, we're going to keep on with these wines. We're going to keep on doing the Jura because we really like the wines. Uh, we think they're absolutely brilliant. Um, this is also by far the best deal on the table. I forget exactly what we sold these for, um, but these were uh, $40.95 retail. Um, I think you guys got them about $2 or $2.20 under cost. So, yeah, we... Um, this is a little bit of a clearinghouse sort of operation because, let's be fair, if I haven't been able to sell it for the last two years, I just want to put this in people's mouths, not to sell this, but to sell you on the idea of Jura so you'd be more open to it. Because, goddammit, Jura's really good. You still need me in a GoPro so you can watch me like look at comments, misread them, and then look back at my glass and then stare hesitantly into space while I try to figure out what to say next. Um, you know what, Devin and I really tried Jura, I think, for the first three to five months after we got back. And I think Devin and I both got really discouraged on the Jura because we really tried so hard to make it a thing. And then we kind of got the, the cognitive dissonance that just because we couldn't make it work after a few months, that just nobody cared, nobody was interested. And I actually became rather averse to recommending things from the Jura because it was so hard to sell and because you kind of put this 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 mental block in yourself when you work in selling things and sales that yeah this isn't working therefore it will never work and some of it does just come from that Um, there's actually a couple of really interesting points. Uh, let's pour some Shen in our glasses here uh, while we kind of get to these, because there's actually uh, three or four really interesting, interesting questions I want to get to right here. Um, is there a big difference in wine taste between us, Calgary, and Edmonton? Um, yes and no. Um, in terms of like natural wines, um, I know this is a big conversation about all the things we got wrong, but let's talk about one thing that we got very, very right. Uh, Devon in particular, I can't take any credit for this. Um, Devon was the one who found um, the natural wine side and got us into it. And he got us into it very, very early. Um, you know, if he hadn't gotten his, us into it, you know, we might be having the talk now of, hey, here's a natural wine. Boy, did we miss the boat on this. Um, but Devon did get us on board with this. Um, we actually sell more natural wine down here than a lot of stores do in Edmonton. Um, we're kind of looked at as a bit of an outlier store in the sense that like, we're almost a Calgary store that happens to exist in Lethbridge. I've had that told me by a few people. Um, we kind of get a really interesting market down here that I would never have expected. Uh, and a lot of wine reps don't expect. Um, a lot of people, the first time they visit us, just they don't get it. And they show up with like three Australian Shirazes and two New Zealand Sauv Blancs and this garbage chili and Merlot. Like, look what you should have in your store. And it's like, get out. And they're really surprised. And they come back down with, you know, a Chablis and a couple of really interesting Italian things and maybe something Spanish and they sell all of them. Um, well, not all. I don't think I've ever 100 percent of a tasting ever in terms of buying them. I got to send them back wanting more. Um, but no, uh, the taste in terms of Calgary and Edmonton versus down here, Lethbridge is always going to be a year or two behind just because, you know, how many people here have a subscription to Wine Spectator? I know I don't. Um, 
it's a little bit behind the times, but only by a bit. And yes, there is the income disparity between Calgary and Lethbridge because yes, in Calgary, you know, we got a PO, Devin and I, uh, from a company called Pion, and it's a list of about 200, 225 wines, most of which, in fact, by far the majority are over $50, $50 a bottle retail. Like 60, 65% of this list is over that. And this goes out to ourselves and the Better Wine Boutiques in Calgary and uh, the guy out in Banff, Mark Renier, uh, as well as the folks up in, um, up in Edmonton. Um, not Mark Renier. Mark Samer, pardon me. Uh, Mark Renier is a Scotch person. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're a little bit isolated down here. And our market percentage, like in terms of dollar value, we have to sell more stuff kind of 30 and under. Whereas in Calgary, like an everyday wine can be 40, $45. Here it's very different. And I, I like that better anyway, because that gets us into things like the AA Badenhorst. Oh, wow, we have so many questions I really want to get to. Um, I'm going to pin the, the questions at Marissa's about uh, Poulsard uh, while we briefly talk about AA Badenhorst. And then Marissa and questions after that, I'll get to that after uh, the Badenhorst. Uh, I'll also have a look if Devin has answered your question. Uh, I'll just kind of let that slide unless uh, I think there's something I desperately, desperately need to add. AA uh, Badenhorst. Um, this wine itself is not a mistake. This is not a wine that I had to buy in bulk. This is not a wine that I had to buy a whole bunch of to get. Um, this is just a bloody tragedy. Um, this is a $41 bottle of wine. This is, I think, like 23 on the shelf, 24 on the shelf. This is just my second swing and a miss on South Africa. South African wines should be absolutely massive for us. South African wines are in terms of internationally, getting tons of press, they're selling really fast. I think our second or third ever like online wine tasting we ever did here was South Africa because of how excited about it I was and I remain equally as excited today. And the Badenhorst is just, to me, an absolute stellar example of what I think is one of the three most important white grape varieties. Riesling, of course, Chardonnay, kind of has to be there. Uh, and Shannon, I think, are the three most versatile, interesting grape varieties. I'd love to talk about Garganega because I'm a huge Garganega fan, but let's be fair, it's not the same thing. Riesling, Chardonnay, and Shannon are the most versatile grape varieties out there. And a part of me might say, you know what? Shannon might be the most versatile of them all. Um, Chenin Blanc is grown in really three places around the world commercially, two of which are to quality. Um, South Africa has by far the most in 2011. There are 18,200 hectares of uh, Chenin in South Africa. It is basically their national grape. Yes, the national grape's Pinotage, but A, I don't like Pinotage, and B, there's a lot more of Chenin Blanc there. Uh, second is France at about 10,000 hectares. Uh, and the wine there generally is of very, very high quality. This is things like uh, Vouvre. Uh, this is things like uh, seven year. Th there are a lot of really exceptional Chenin Blanc wines in France, uh, although the numbers in terms of plantings remain relatively fixed. And then there's number three. Then there's good old USA, where Chenin Blanc has 9,000 hectares, so only 1,000 hectares less than France does. And okay, with the understanding that in the wine world, there are exceptions to everything. Nobody tells, nobody please tell me, hey, my brother-in-law, Tim, makes this world-class Chenin Blanc in California. I'm sure that is true, and he probably makes 500 cases of it. But in terms of like global production, that's effectively nothing. I'm talking big picture. Um, Chenin Blanc in California is effectively a nothing. Uh, it's used to prop up a lot of California Chardonnays. Now, if we're in France, this Savignon, it says Savignon, it has to be 100% Savignon on the label. In South Africa, uh, the labels are a little looser. It's 80%. So this Chenin Blanc has to be 80% Chenin. Um, in Italy, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, the rules are a little looser, and we'll talk about them when we get to the last wine. Because um, I'm not going to have that conversation, because then I'll literally have run out of things to talk about with the fourth wine. In California, and in Canada, actually, in all of USA and Canada, it's 75%. So if I sell you this, you know, let's just pretend this Australian Shiraz is a California Cabernet, which is neither of those things, but it's the bottle I have in my hand. Um, let's just pretend this is a California Cabernet Sauvignon. It says 
California, yes, it does have to be American, or at least the wine has to be picked, crushed, and fermented in the United States. Um, but it says Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, that's a really interesting statement, considering that by law, only 75% of the grapes in that wine have to be Cabernet Sauvignon. Let's say you have a really cold year and your Cabernet doesn't ripen. It could be 25% Merlot to give it more fruit. Or you have a very lean year, the wines are very simple and very austere. Well, we could just, you know, put in 25% Malbec to add some spice. Or I just want the wine to be bigger and boozier and punchier. Let's just put in 25% Zin. It's all labeled Cabernet Sauvignon. So when you're talking about Californian Chardonnay, a great variety that it's grown in a really hot climate, really struggles to get acidity. It can come off way too soft, it can come off very flabby. So can Pinot Grigio when it's grown way too hot. What does California make absolute buckets of that need to be made cheaply and need to be made, you know, that say that particular great variety on the label? Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay. 9,000 hectares of Chenin Blanc. I can think of exactly one American Chenin Blanc I've ever seen and one Chenin Blanc blend. All of this Chenin is being used because it's so acidic and structural and delicious to plump up and fix bad Chardonnay and bad Pinot Grigio coming out of California and to a lesser extent Washington, Oregon. That's where Chenin Blanc's unfortunately lost. There is some in South America, there is some in Canada, there is some in Australia and New Zealand and around, but really, when we're talking Chenin, at least Chenin you want to drink, we're talking South Africa and France. Uh, Marissa asked about Pulsar. I just want to make sure that Devin didn't already answer this question. Yes, he did, actually. Um, sorry, there's just so many questions, and thank you. Please keep them coming. I am just trying to quickly get through these um, without getting really bogged down. Uh, dee -dee 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 -dee. Man, Devin's just killing it tonight, by the way. Thank you, Devin. Absolutely, absolutely killing it tonight. Um, so, why did South Africa not work? Well, I actually don't know on this one. So, I did mention very early on that this was the second time that I got South Africa wrong. The first time was right as Australia was starting to flag and Argentina was about to go nuts, but I didn't know Argentina was going to go nuts. And this was a big conversation that was kind of going on in the, not just Albertan, but international wine industry was, okay, Australia's falling off. It's the end of 10, 15 years of Australian super dominance from kind of 1995 to 2010. And if you want to say it's 98 to 2013, I won't fight you on it. That, that era is ending. What's next? And nobody really knew. I didn't see Argentina. I genuinely didn't. I mean, I've talked about this before. When I started here, we carried three Argentine wines, and I got in trouble for selling one of them. Um, Argentina didn't seem like the next big thing. South Africa, to me, seemed like the next big thing. So I went all in on South Africa. I brought in tons and tons and tons of it. This was, I think, my very first or maybe second year as like manager of the store. I was really green. Uh, and it really spectacularly didn't work. South Africa was the wrong answer. The correct answer was Argentina. And we ended up flogging South African wine for 10 cents above cost for weeks and months and months because we bought so damn much of it entirely on my missed call. Um, this time, I don't think I'm as guilty. South Africa is having an absolutely massive moment in the sun internationally. It is absolutely spectacular in terms of quality. Like. The 70 and the AA Badenhorst, if you, there's a $16 difference, $17 difference between what the, these two wines cost. If you like the Badenhorst at $16 less, more than the 70 and I don't blame you. I am really struggling to pick between the two. And that's a six, $16 is like a respectable bottle of rosé difference. Like you could walk out with this and a decent bottle of like rosé for summertime drinking for the same price as that. I'm not blaming anyone for picking this. South African wine is an amazing deal. And let's talk a little bit about why. Um, South Africa, and I realize I'm now horribly overdue on this because I am trying to keep this to an hour-ish, um, but there's a lot to talk about here. Um, 
Let's talk about South Africa a little bit in terms of history. Um, we'll kind of break it up into pre-apartheid, uh, so pre-1948, and post-1993, post-apartheid. Um, before 1948, South Africa actually had a real moat in the sun, uh, kind of during the British imperial years. Uh, they made a dessert wine called Constantia, uh, which was basically a wine that sold for substantially more than Bordeaux or Burgundy or anything else, uh, up to two to three times what a first growth Bordeaux would sell for. That kind of died out around the year 1900. Um, and by 1948, we kind of unfortunately hit the apartheid era and effectively exports stop. So when exports stop for a wine region, we saw this with Austria and Hungary and the Czech Republic uh, with uh, the rise of the Iron Curtain. When exports stop, that has absolutely never been a good thing for the, inter for the wine quality overall. South Africa pivoted from being a small number of predominantly like uh, Dutch Afrikaners owned wine estates that were going for, you know, reasonable quality for the standards of, you know, just after the Second World War to basically going straight into the KWV, which was this giant wine cooperative entirely focused on two things. One, bulk wine for domestic consumption, because South Africa at that point in terms of, you know, domestic consumption was beer and spirits oriented, just like everybody else was. They basically left wine untaxed to try and bring up, you know, consumption locally because their entire export market disappeared overnight uh, as you know, more and more uh, embargoes were laid against them with apartheid. Um, the other thing that happened was a huge chunk of the wine that was actually produced was sold off for brandy production. So a lot of vineyards were planted with really, really boring, not very interesting grapes, uh, which very often ended up actually being Chenin Blanc because okay, it's not going to crop as much as if we plant something worse, but there's tons of it here and we get cuttings for free. We can basically plant the field for free and understand it's not going to be as productive. So there ended up being absolutely tons of Chenin Blanc planted in South Africa. Post-1993, um, there's been a 2,000% increase since 1993 in the uh, amount of what we would call premium South African wines produced. Because all of a sudden, the international world was like, oh, yeah, these guys actually can make some pretty incredible wines. Now that they're not being racist dicks, we can actually sell them. Um, so, yeah, South African wine is kind of enjoying a bit of a renaissance. Their wines were very out of fashion when they first got going. They were coming out of a very, you know, domestically oriented, cooperative oriented, not quality focused industry. So when they were all of a sudden thrown into the international stage, you know, around 1994, 95, they didn't do very well because let's be fair, they had a captive market. They were making so much wine and they had just buckets and buckets of excess that they weren't importing anything. And it wasn't taxed, it was just floating around the domestic market. People were used to buying wine for pennies on the dollar and for it being bad. And these, mar these wineries were used to just, yep, we harvested the grapes, take it over to the grain elevator and sell it to the co-op and well, that's the year of farming done. It was almost like building a wine industry from the ground up starting in 1994. Um, they've come a long way in really only like 25-ish years. And now we're starting to see some of, the, uh, some of the results of that come out. Mm. What drives these geographical swings for people buying wine? Craig, if you could actually predict that, you would be by far the richest man in the room. Um, I don't know. I mean, let, let, let's dial this back a little bit, back to my, my conversation about, you know, me assuming that, you know, out of Australia would come South Africa. You know, how did that kind of transition? Well, it came from North Americans discovering wine uh, because of really aggressive marketing and very smart marketing in the 1980s by the California wine industry that literally got North Americans drinking wine today. Whatever you think of Gallo or Mondavi or any of those guys, I mean, I never drink their wines, but the only reason really any of us are here drinking wine in 2021 was because those folks laid the groundwork. North American wine consumption basically starts with Gallo and ends with Mondavi. Is that a horrifying oversimplification? Yes, but it's also mostly true. Um, out of that, then we got into the big Californian wine boom where people started buying wine by the grape variety like Chardonnay or Merlot or Cabernet, and they stopped buying it by like French wine region like Bordeaux or Burgundy or the Rhone Valley. From there, we end up getting into this scene where California is huge and it keeps getting bigger 
and bigger and bigger. And California is basically dominating the entire wine scene. And then two things happened. One, they almost priced themselves out of the market in the United States. And at about the same time, the Canadian dollar took a nosedive. And California wines went from being like, every day, let's just buy this for $13 to this same wine, like 18 months, 24 months later, is suddenly $21. Combination of currency exchange and just the Californians kind of getting drunk on their own Kool-Aid. Um, and out of that, we kind of hit this moment where it's like, oh, well, here we are. Now we're kind of in this position where we have this wine that we don't want to buy anymore. What else is out there? And into that whole steps Chile, who also makes Cabernet and Chardonnay and Merlot and most importantly, Sauvignon Blanc. And that steps in, but they're half the price of the Californians. Like I can remember selling Santa Alicia Cabernet Merlot for like $9.95, $10.95, and just going through cases of it around the year 2000. Uh, and that was after the Chilean wine boom. We were already on the downslope. We like, by the time I joined the industry, Australia was already on the big upswing. Chile kind of had to stay in the sun. People drank the really cheap stuff. They were grateful for it, but they were used to a higher grade of wine. But Chile really was not set up for making wines that were, you know, oak aged or a little higher premium quality. They just weren't geared for that. So Australia stepped into that hole and then they stayed in that spot for 15 years. And now we're into a, a thing where everybody is used to drinking 14 to 14 and a half percent alcohol reds. They like them fruity. They don't like them too oaky. They just rejected South American wines by basically saying no to Chile. Everybody's ready for the next thing. They like spicy, high alcohol, oaky reds. I said, okay, well, South Africa has buckets of Shiraz planted there. They have a respectable amount of cab. Yes, they have Pinotage and Sanso, sure. But like coming out of Australia, we're all looking for like the next Shiraz. And then it went on to Argentina. Um, so yeah, there, there's reasons for why these things happen, but you can also understand why sometimes these things don't transition. Oh, is it promo time, Aaron? We're not even after the third wine yet. I don't care. You don't care? We're just doing the promo now? It's a, it is it promo. seven? It is 641. 641. Good Lord. Okay. So according to Aaron, it's apparently promo time. Promo clock. Good Lord, this has gone on for quite some time. But it's a good topic. I hope nobody's really desperately sitting there bored, just like, by God, Kyle, hit the fourth wine so I can log off. Um, <laughs> I imagine there's like three people like that and everybody else is pretty chill. But yes, uh, for those three of you who are really not into how long this is taking, I do apologize. So I will try to keep our promos fairly short because we have taken so long on the first two wines. Uh, this coming Wednesday, it is dry hop sour time. I'm really excited for this one. Uh, I actually was going to do this last week, but I waited so that we could get cellophane flowers in here. Uh, a few beer tastings ago, I actually talked about doing a love letter to do a tang beer tasting, which I realized was, you know, a wildly unfair way to do a beer tasting because it would be unfair to the other three beers. So this is my love letter to dry hot sours or unfruited sours. For the eagle-eyed among you, you probably noticed that the establishment does say passion fruit. Yes, it is, but the hops are really present and they're an important part of the beer. So we are going to talk about dry hot sours next week, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Beer tasting, as always, $20. Now, next week, for the very first time, we are actually going to have a properly well made up, it took me three and a half bloody hours to make all these damn things, I hope you people are grateful, uh, we are going to have our very first scotch tasting kit. Uh, this is the Andrew Hilton Little Tiny Bottles That Are Really Annoying Scotch Tasting Number 1. Uh, so this is our four years of scotch, so these are whiskeys that start at uh, 10 years old and get as old as 13. Uh, they, go, they cover a reasonably wide range of different tastes. We have the 10 year old Flotilla, uh, which is a very soft, very spicy malt. We get into the Knock and Dough, which is a very green, very planty, very kind of, mm, very like herbal spirit, which I really dig. Uh, into the Glen Ord, which is Honestly and truly, I have never had a Glenord I liked this much. I'm absolutely over the moon in love with this Glenord. I think that uh, you folks will be as well. And then we just say, fuck it and get into the madness. Uh, this is 68.6% cask strength Buna Haven. Uh, it's absolute madness and I absolutely love it. I actually like this, even though it's almost 70% alcohol, I like this without water. 
I don't love it without water, but it's surprisingly drinkable. Uh, we have 22 tasting kits to sell uh, because when I measured all these out into even ounces, I wasted about exactly one ounce doing it. Uh, so I have 23 kits made, one for me, 22 to sell. Kits are 30 bucks, and that will be next Friday night. And I think that's the fastest we've ever gotten through shameless commercialism Very corner. Yep. Yes, quick, fast, good. Uh, it wasn't a matter that we figured out how to do it. It is that I think three days before Christmas, the Alberta Gaming and Liquor Commission finally gave us permission to do it. We always knew those Uline bottles were out there. We always had the technology. We just didn't have liquor board approval. Electrical tape tops. Electrical tapes tops, yes, because we have to have that tamper-proof seal, which I is a, a better idea for you. I, I'm sure you I'll, do. Yeah, I'll uh, let you know. And thank you for everyone who's saying that you actually have nothing but time. I, I also have nothing but time, so I appreciate that. Okay, so these next two wines do th share a bit of a common theme. And this is something I've touched on a couple of times uh, over the years. Um, our real problem that our Italian section was for decoration only for quite some time. So Devin and I both passionately, passionately love Italian wine. Doesn't matter. Tuscany, Piedmont. Okay, I'm more of the southern Italy dork than he is, uh, at least as regards Campania. He often makes fun of me because of how much I love Alianico. And I, I don't think I've ever said it, but I really don't like how much he likes Sicily. I think it just makes him a lesser person, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have these wonderful, wonderful appreciations for Italy. We love all of it as a whole, but our Italian section wasn't selling. And that was a global thing. That was a absolutely global thing. Everywhere except Italy, Italian wine was just in the toilet. Nobody could sell it. So when Devin and I decided to take the bold step of saying, okay, well, why isn't Italy selling? Well, let's take our Californian section and cut it by 20 wines and expand our Italian section by 20 wines and just see how that helps. Spoiler warning, that didn't help at all. Um, then we actually said, okay, well, maybe it's not about quantity. Maybe it's about quality. And we pulled more than half of our Italian wines and we redid the section. And if you were in here about 18 months ago, you would have seen like bunks where, um, Aaron, like, do you have this on camera? Is this on? It can be. It can be? Okay. On a bunk like this, which is the same layout that we have for Italy, um, these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11. These are 11 wide. Five out of the 11 could just be missing. They could be an empty spot because Devin and I had sold out or blown out the old item, but we weren't willing to bring in something new because we wanted it to be something we really liked and it was something different. Now, out of that, we brought in a lot of different things. We tried a lot of different strategies and we had a lot of fun doing it. I learned so much about Italian wine, rebuilding our Italian section with Devin. Like it was so much fun just trying different stuff. Uh, and we still don't have a damn Primitivo on the shelf because I don't have any I like, but we really learned a lot and we had a lot of fun doing it. But because we took kind of the shotgun approach of trying so many different things, trying so many different wines, well, you win some, you lose some. And these are a couple of wines where we just, we didn't get it right. So that's our next two wines. Ooh, the com the the uh, the very controversial t uh, question is: Amon Ra worth the price? Really hope my dad's not watching. I don't <laughs> think it is. Um, okay, Amon Ra is a big, high alcohol, incredibly heavily oaked pure fruit expression of Australian Shiraz in the style that was incredibly popular ten years ago. If you really like that style of wine, which is horribly out of fashion, yes, you absolutely would find it exactly to your taste. It's exactly the style that it's supposed to be. It's a very good expression of that. Is it to me the most interesting style of Australian wine? 
No, I would rather have something like Best Thompson Family or something that's a little more spicy and a little more like the Australian wines I started drinking in the early 2000s that were wines from the 1990s. I also think that Australia, uh, with wineries like Yeti and the Coconut and BK Wines, uh, I think they're doing something more interesting with the Australian style. But if you like that style that is kind of the Heartland wine style, uh, that really had its absolute peak around 2012, 2013, if that's your absolute be all end all of what wine is, yes, you will absolutely love that. It's just not my style of wine. And I think that right now, considering how much that style of wine is shrinking in terms of sales, prices should have come down and they haven't. So that's my two cents. That said, if nobody buys it, coming soon to a wines that we didn't sell near you because it's entirely my fault for bad talking it, Amun Ra. Okay, uh, let's jump in here. I also realized I didn't talk very much about the AA Baden Horse because we got so distracted. Um, Devin, if you're still watching, would you give us a little bit of a tasting note on that one uh, in terms of production notes and everything? Because uh, I just want to keep going because we are at 10 minutes to 7 and I am not even on the third one yet. Uh, so this is St. Magdalene. Uh, and I believe it is actually Maps O'Clock there, Aaron. Oh, my. I know. You just got the camera set. I was waiting. Unbelievable. Just to do that to you. It actually was not intentional at all. All right, ready. All right you ready? All right, Maps O'Clock. Here we go. So, we are up here. We are north of the city of Venice. Oh, we're not there yet. Oh, we're not there yet? Not there yet. Come on, focus. Come on, focus. Uh, Devin, uh, in terms of which, just a, a tasting note on the A.A. Baden Horse Chenin Blanc. I know that I'm the one with a glass of it in front of me, and you're not, but I'm imposing on you very rudely. Uh, so, here is the city of Venice. Now, this is Lake Garda. Now, what, all of the things that we've tasted from Italy in the last little while, like all of those wines uh, from... Uh, Bartolino were kind of right here, the ones from Valpolicella were in here, the ones from Suave were kind of the northern tip. All of this area is all Prosecco country. Amarone comes from here, Ripasso comes from here. Um, there's some amazing Sauvignon Blancs that actually come from over here in the Slovenian hills. Um, but we're all the way up here in Bolzano, right up next to like the Swiss-Austrian border. Like we're way the heck up there. Oh, yeah, um, and that is not, not Bolzano, Bolzano. <laughs> It's not the bloody Calgary suburb, you... East of... East Calgary. of, sure. Um, fine. But yes, that is the village of Bolzano. Uh, so we're up in the Sud Tyrol. And up there, the regional specialty is wines made from the great varieties of Chiava and Lagrine. Now, Lagrine we see a little tiny bit. Uh, it's used even further uh, south and west of there. Uh, there's quite a bit of Lagrine grown in Piedmont, where it's blended with Nebbiolo and Barbera and Dolcetto. Lagrine's actually increasing in plantings. Um, it's pretty widely respected as being a great variety in that area. Um, but the Shiava, which literally means slave, which that bodes well for the rest of this, um, it's one of those great varieties that's never really been taken off. Like, if you read the, uh, the Oxford Wine Companion on that grape variety, basically Jansen Robinson just spends her time, like, scolding you for bothering to look up Shiava, because who would want to be interested in a grape variety this boring? So, okay, all that aside, what is it? Why did we care? Why did it fail? Uh, what it is, is it's a very old grape variety, kind of native to northern Italy, southern Germany, and Switzerland. Um, in terms of plantings, it's grown here in the Sutural and Alto Adige. It's also grown in the southern German wine region of uh, Württemberg. It's actually the most planted red grape in Liechtenstein, uh, and there's actually quite a bit in Switzerland as well. Why is it planted there? It's a red grape that historically does very, very well with high altitude and cold temperatures, things you tend to get a lot of in the Alps. Why did I think it was a good idea? I think it's like the fifth time that you've kicked the tripod on your way past the camera, by the way. Don't worry about it. Don't, just, just don't point it out. <laughs> don't talk about it. No, I'm going to point it out. Not because I think it's a quality issue, just to make fun of you, Aaron. Um, so why did I think this was a good idea? Why do you think this would be a fit for the store? Well, when I brought this in, I did a lot of looking into this, and I said, okay, well, 
Italian sales at that point were just starting to pick up, but what was selling well for us? Well, natural wines were, high, high acid reds were, and in particular, Beaujolais was. And when I did some digging into this, I, I read, came across an article that said, Saint Magdalena, the Beaujolais of Northern Italy. And that kind of drew my eye because we were selling a lot of Beaujolais at the time. I said, okay, well, we're really trying to grow our Italian sales. We really want to sell more Italian red wine in general. We're selling a lot of Beaujolais. Maybe this would be a really cool, like, cross-regional hit. Spoiler warning, it's in this lineup. It wasn't. Why wasn't it? Um, I think wines like this, these, these very light, low-alcohol red wines, they don't travel well. They're very susceptible to what we call travel shock. Even a giant, what, 16.5% red wine like this Amon Ra, 15, pardon me, um, even big, chunky, high-alcohol reds are subject to travel shock. It happens to every wine. Yes, sometimes you can get lucky and a wine will just be fine when it shows up, but that's not usually the standard. But really low alcohol, really delicate, light reds are really susceptible to travel shock. So when this showed up, it was kind of muddy, and Devin and I were like, okay, we tasted it. It's fine. It's probably what we expected. We'll get back to it in three months, see how it's coming along. And then we didn't. And then we kind of forgot about it. And that's just what happens when you're in a store with a thousand wines, and you're in a store where there are tons of different things that, you know, you you want to get excited about every week. I mean, we can bring in 10 to 15 to 20 new wines in a single week. And you just, sometimes things get forgotten in the shuffle. So this got forgotten. Oh, a couple of interesting questions. Deirdre asks, um, why did it decant this red and not the others? Um, for two reasons, actually. The first one uh, is these little decanters, which are also a failure on our part. Um, my mum brought these in uh, when she was still around, uh, and uh, she thought these were going to be like a huge hit, so she brought in like 48 of these tiny decanters, uh, and they literally sold to absolutely no one. Uh, I think we ended up giving like 24 of them to Coco Pazzo's for free because we absolutely couldn't shift them. Uh, and B, because when I first opened this, um, it was really tight and closed and aggressively sour. Uh, and Aaron and I actually talked about this and, uh, and said, well, we need to decant. We need to do something with it because this isn't showing well. And when I opened the decanter cupboard, this was sitting right at the back. I was like, oh, it's disappointments and failures week. This is perfect. Uh, so that's why. The wine was a little tight, and also I think these tiny decanters are adorable, and also it's, a, it's an old school failure from way back. And we only had one. And we only had one, yeah. We only have one of those. And yeah, I think Wines That Didn't Sell 2 is coming because this has been a lot of fun. We've had so much to talk about, and I've thoroughly enjoyed every second of it. I mean, I always generally enjoy mm -hmm. these. There's been one or two. Uh, there was one that I did that was really hungover for, uh, and I won't say which one, uh, but that one I still think is perhaps my weakest performance. It actually turned out to be fine. Thank God we had an interview that week, so I could just be like, yes, that's very interesting, and just entirely like be dead behind my eyes the whole thing. So it went very well. But yeah, no, it was, uh, it was something. Uh, Grant actually asked a really interesting question. Um, and, and Devin did, did answer it, uh, but I want to expand on it just a little bit. Um, why, why grow our Italian wine sales? Because Italy is, to the same extent as France, and to a greater extent than even Spain, Italy's really screaming important. From northeastern Italy in Piedmont, where we have Barolo and Barbaresco, and we also have just Nebbiolo in general uh, coming from other smaller regions like Gemi and Gattinara. We have Dolcetto and we have um, Barbera. We cross the, uh, to the other side of Italy, and we have Prosecco, we have Veneto, we, which includes like um, Valpolicella and Ripasso, Bar uh, Bartolino, uh, Amaroni. We have Prosecco in there, we have Suave in there, um, we have the, the crazy Slovenian Alps Sauve Blancs, and then we start moving south and we hit like Tuscany, and we hit like Verdicchio, and just all of Italy, 
arguably is almost more interesting than France because there's so much going on. And also because just Italy's had a real run of great vintages and because Italy's been having just a hell of a time globally. Like they, they've been absolutely blowing up globally and it wasn't happening here. And this is to a certain point a fake it till you make it sort of scenario where like it's happening internationally. Devin and I can't get enough of it. We're almost going to pour it down your throats till you folks like it sort of scenario because we're so excited about it. So some of that does come down to that. No, sadly, you, uh, I'm sure my mom would love you uh, were she still alive. She, but no, you, uh, you cannot get one of the adorable decanters. They were There's perhaps, the it's the only one left. <laughs> Unless you go to the Coco Pazzo estate sale. Exactly. But no, unfortunately, the, the adorable decanters were a massive sales failure, and I only have this one left. It's pretty good. I like the little tiny decanter. I think it's adorable as heck. I think this will actually return to several more tastings because it's adorable, and I really like it. glassware buy. Well, we actually did a, a big uh, glassware buy, and then um, things happened, and I, won't, I don't want to get into happen. that. Things happen. By golly. And yes, there. Ooh, a group glassware buy. There you go. Um, Tupperware party. Won't be a Tupperware party. <laughs> I mean, it could be a socially distant Tupperware party. That could be kind of fun. Um, <laughs> let's put a pin in that terrible, terrible idea you just came up with. We'll return to it later. Okay. So let's, um, let's get on to our final wine here, the Caneto Rosso di Montepulciano. Now, I will briefly touch on the fact that there are two Montepulcianos. There's Montepulciano the Grape, uh, which is also broadly from Tuscany. It comes from the region of Abruzzo, which is directly adjacent to Tuscany. Um, and it tends to make very soft, very fruity, very easy drinking wines. It is also grown in certain parts of Tuscany, uh, known as Maremma, where it's blended with Sangiovese, and it tends to make you know, very soft, fruity, Sangiovese-influenced wines. That's not what we're talking about. Montepulciano is also a very famous hillside. Uh, Montepulciano is one hill and one village uh, in the southern but bit of Tuscany, uh, just like Montalcino is. Uh, and just like Barolo and Barbaresco, it's generally thought where Barolo is the more masculine, longer-lived side, Barbaresco tends to be more feminine, prettier, and I will actually say that Barbaresco is more floral, and it does drink younger, uh, version of the same idea. Uh, both are based in Sangiovese, both Montepulciano and Montalcino. And yes, Montalcino does tend to be bigger, more expressive. It's hotter there. It has a more ideal sighting. It has black soils, which reflects the heat. It does tend to be a bigger, richer, more powerful wine. And this is something that I got into with my dad a little bit this afternoon when I called him about this, because I wanted to know what a bottle of Vino Nobile di Montepulciano sold for back in 1985 when he opened, and he's like, yeah, it was like three bucks more than Wolf Blast, and now it's 15 more than the bottle of Wolf Blast. Um, Montepulciano has kind of gotten a bad rap. It's traditionally in the quality standards, you know, Chianti, Chianti Classico, Chianti Classico Re uh, Reserva, then Montepulciano, then Montalcino, and then like your super Razzy, Dazzy, Sassicais, and Tignanellos, and very fancy super Tuscans that no one will ever actually up, end up drinking. Um, and they'll just die of old age in some rich person's cellar. Um, I love Montepulciano. It's kind of the forgotten middle child. It's the Jan of Tuscany. Um, you have Chianti that's, you know, everyday and affordable. Aaron apparently loved that one. Um, it's affordable and it's everyday. You can get a good example for like eighteen ninety five, and everybody likes it. And you have Brunello. Brunello's great and it's 50 to $70 and it's a prestige thing. And like, we have six bloody Brunello di Montalcinos right now and they all sell. And you have Mont Montepulciano kind of you know, in the middle, inventing a fake Canadian boyfriend. And it's, it's very sad because I really like Montepulciano because it's really pretty and wonderful and delicate and has so much to offer. So what is Montepulciano? Uh, uh, Aaron's crying at the minute, by the way. <laughs> Get yourself together, man. You're trying to be a cameraman. Um, 
So what is Montepulciano? Montepulciano is a hillside in southern Tuscany. Uh, the wine itself has been thought of very highly. Um, the cellar master of Pope Paul III back in 1549 called it the perfect wine. Um, it was one of the very first four DOCGs in all of Italy. Now I think there are 16, 15 or 16 DOCGs in all of Italy, um, but there were four that first formed them uh, in 1980, and three of them you've almost certainly heard of. You've heard of Brunello di Montalcino. Everybody's probably familiar. You've heard of Borello. You've heard of Barbaresco. These are really famous Italian wines. The fourth was Montepulciano, Vino Nobile. Um, these were not region, th this somehow has always ended up being like the redheaded stepchild of the region. Um, apparently I went straight into that one. Um, so um, I did kind of cover this already. This is a region that has been quietly growing uh, in 1966 when the DOC was declared, uh, which is basically a legal designation of what is and isn't this region and what grape varieties are allowed to do in this region. Um, for those of you not familiar with the European wine industry, I'll quickly take a very quick diversion here. Um, in Canada, if I want to plant 30 rows of Cabernet and then 30 rows of Zweigelt and 30 rows of Sangiovese and 30 rows of Savignon, nobody cares. If you're in Tuscany, especially if you're in like a very tightly controlled region like Montepulciano, um, in order to protect the name and the prestige of Montepulciano, they will tell you what different types of grapes you can plant, what your blend will ultimately end up being, what your minimum alcohol will be, what your minimum and maximum sugars at the end will be, uh, what your minimum acid has to be. Um, and all of these, I think, are very, very good things. Basically, to make a DOC wine, you have to meet all of those restrictions and meet all of the minimum alcohols and acidities and everything else. To be a DOCG, it's another step, and it's a very Italian step. So you've met all of these chemical agreements, but then all of the old gray hairs, all the old men and women of the industry that have been doing this for 40 years, they all sit down around a big table, and completely blind, they get brought out a glass of wine. Now, you might think that all these people, they'd know, well, this is my wine, obviously. I, I know what my wine tastes like. No, you wouldn't. When you get brought out, you know, 15 Rosa di Montepulcianos or 50 Rosa di Montepulcianos in a row, and then another 150 Vino Nobiles, you have no idea which one's yours. And it's literally pass fail with these. Yes or no? You don't know if you made it or not. You um, very famously, um, uh, the, the grand old man, um, Signore Antinori, um, he actually said no to one of his own prestige wines uh, on one particular vintage. And he completely defended. He's like, yep, I made that wine. I said no to that wine. This is how the system is supposed to work. Um, so no, DOCG, not only do you have to meet all these base quality standards, you have to meet a blind tasting panel of people from that region who know this wine intimately, who make this wine, and say yes, no. So DOCG wines are really interesting that way. Um, so <laughs> this is why we stay late. Uh, I'm <laughs> glad you all stayed late. Um, so Rosso di Montepulciano is, generally speaking, the lighter, less long-lived wines. Vino Nobile di Montepulciano uh, starts around $35, can get up to $45. Uh, Brunello starts around $15, goes up to, I think, the, the really insane um, Brunello di Montepulciano. Um, the one that comes in actually like a cardboard tube, like a scotch. I think like the new vintage of that is about 225 retail. So Brunello's not cheap. Um, this particular region, the wines are Chianti elevated. They're prettier, they're richer, but they're also somehow softer. They're a little lower in alcohol than in Brunello. They're just, they're everything I like about Sangiovese, elevated but not with the alcohol, not with the power, not with the, with the oak. They're, they're just delicate and pretty and ethereal, and I absolutely love Rosso and Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Um, Vino uh, Rosso di Montepulciano, um, they make the wines every fall. They'll generally be harvested in August, September, in a really weird year, even into the first week of October. Uh, Rosso di Montepulcianos are generally released the following March. Uh, Vino Nobile, which is the, the grand wine, those are generally released the, it has to be at least 24 months since crush date. Uh, so since they stopped being grapes and became juice, uh, it has to be 24 months from that day.
And yet it is basically peer review, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent way of putting it. It's literally a bunch of grouchy people who've done this before sitting around saying, this wine's no good. Uh, and I absolutely love that. And I, that's why I think DOCG is, you know, the... <sighs> I, I like the French AOC system. I like VQA. I like a lot of things that have happened around the world. But to me, DOCG is the most honest. You're sitting down. You, you finally make it. You're considered one of the great winemakers of your industry. And the absolute pinnacle award you can get is that you get to sit around this big table. And your award might be that you shoot down every single one of the wines you made that year. And I think that's amazing. It's so honest. Sounds like a Wednesday afternoon here. <laughs> a little bit. Thanks, Mike. So yeah, um, I don't know where to begin with rankings on this. Um, hmm. You know, I think I'm going to go the AA Badenhorst first, Savigny in a very close second, the Rosso third, and I'm going to give the Rottensteiner fourth for me. And that's not to say I don't love this. This is actually a wine that I literally bring in, uh, and I always tell Devin how much of this I'm going to bring in. It's always like five, eight, ten cases at a time. He always rolls his eyes because it's like, oh, well, Kyle, you like that wine, but nobody else does. Um, and he's not wrong. There's a reason it's on this lineup. Uh, I always bring this in because I love it. Um, but I still ranked it third after the two whites because those two whites are absolutely killer. One, four, two, three. One, four, two, three again. So, okay, I'm, I'm somewhat vindicated. This finished second twice, which means that from here on out, no one will rank it above last. But two, one, four, three. Deirdre is the same as me. Yeah, it, it really is Deanne, isn't it? Like, this was this was tough for me. I mean, this Baden horse is so immediately likable, and I also know it's, like, literally the cheapest thing on the table in terms of price point, and it stands out so much above the rest to me in terms of, like, value for dollar and everything else, and also my love for South Africa. But I loved all of these things when I brought them in. Like, all of these I have a personal attachment to, and I have, like, a... I love this wine. I love South Africa. I love the Jura I drank in... Uh, Calgary when I was doing my formal wine education. I really loved this stupid like galaxy brained idea I had about selling Italian Beaujolais and Lethbridge that totally didn't pan out. I mean I love all these ideas. And that's the other thing. Uh, actually Laverne uh, nails it on the nose and kind of the, the overall broad point I wanted to talk about. I mean we do sell wines that I think are bad and can be massive sales, you know, successes. God helps us. We still sell six bottles of Pothic Red a week. After nine months of me telling you people how goddamn bad it is, we still sell six bottles a week. But there are lots of things in the store that we absolutely love that don't work. To a certain point, wine quality doesn't necessarily speak to wine sales success. I mean, it really can be this razor's edge of, we get something brilliant, but that particular week, we get five other brilliant things, and it just kind of gets missed. Um, you know, I think that actually as a very good example, on Tuesday, I picked up so much beer in Calgary. Like I picked up one new annex and three new establishments and two new cabins. We got a new 88 today. As much as I like all of those beers, one of those is probably going to just become missed, forgotten. Unless I do it like a Wednesday night beer tasting, it's going to get missed because it was too much all at once. It happens. It just absolutely happens. I know. Look at all these people loving white wines. Well, we, uh, we did kind of cheat a $41 white wine into an $85 wine tasting. <laughs> Uh, it, it is kind of cheating when you sell something literally below cost. That that does tend to swing votes a little bit. <clears throat> but yeah, that was our uh, that was our big misses tasting, which turned out to be a big hit. 
because irony's not dead. Um, yeah, Aaron, you got anything else for us? Do you have a ranking for us? Why oh, have you? Been... Haven't really thought about it. I've been busy. But... Yeah, you have been busy. Um. Nope. Mm -mm. No idea. Mike, you're the same way. Uh, I haven't even had the Kinetto yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, but excluding the Kinetto, I would go uh, one three two. One three two. Yeah. I would, um, I just started drinking the Kinetto. Yep. I think I'm probably two, three, one. No, I, well, actually, who knows? Who knows with, with that? Okay, fair enough. Yeah, could bugger it all up. But. Is there a sweet spot for wine price, uh, Jeremy? <clears throat> yes and no. Um, I will always stump to the fact that the wine price sweet spot is different for different people. Um, Devin and I spend quite literally way more time worrying about the... 12 to 19 dollar price point make sure making sure we have awesome stuff in that price point because let's be fair Devin and i can find stuff between 30 and 40 dollars that will absolutely knock your socks off all day long the issue is there's way too damn much of it and we have to pick and choose 20 to 30 Devin and i have pretty free reign we can get a lot of neat stuff but let's be fair there's some overpriced stuff in there too 12 to 20 there are people who really love wine that don't have a wallet that's big enough to go like past 20 dollars and that's totally fair Devin and i spend more time working and stressing and just just tasting and, and grinding like worrying about this 12 to 20 dollar price point because it's so important to me and so important to him that wine be for everyone it'd be so easy to just say yeah welcome to Andrew hilton everything starts at 30 dollars F you. That would be very easy to do. That's the Calgary Wine Store philosophy to a certain point. Man, I just made like nine Ooh. enemies. Um, but no, I, I, I don't be believe that at all. It's <laughs> I, I really, there, there was a reason that Vegas and Doe at $12.95 made our top 10. Um, it's because it kicked ass at $12.95. Um, I think every top 10 we've ever had, we've had at least one wine under 20 bucks. Because the sub 20 category matters because that's where you bring people into being wine drinkers. It's where you get people when they're 19, 20, 21 that are looking to explore wine. They're not going to start with a $25 Rossi di Montepulciano. And to be honest, it's a very involved, complex wine. They're not going to like it right away. You need to get people, you know, with a wine that's a little less expensive but shows all that wine can be. And I think that's very important. So, no. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we're done there. Nice. Yeah, this was a lot of fun, folks. I thoroughly enjoyed every second of this. This was, this might be actually my favorite one I've done since the one where, um, uh, well, no, the hangover one was terrible. We'll never speak of that again. I was going to say the one where uh, the guy from Avril Creek didn't remember, he didn't realize he was on camera until mm -hmm. two-thirds of the way through the tasting, Absolute which is still awesome. my favorite one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I think we're going to call this a great success. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're going to log off, and we're going to call that a heck of a Friday night. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, we will see you next week for beer and or scotch, and we will come up with a fun, cool idea for wine for two weeks from now. Good night, everybody. This was great.